Um, in the next three weeks, we are going to be learning about the history of mass communications in the United States. We're going to learn about the tremendous challenges of truth decay right now. And then we're going to also learn about the ingenuity that's going to see us through this. Our guide is going to be Robert Rogers. I first met Robert in a Southern California newsroom when we were both hired to be reporters for the Community News, a small community news department for the San Bernardino Sun. So this was many years ago. Uh, since then, his credentials have expanded to include uh, staff writer for the Contra Costa Times, uh, Berkeley School of Journalism lecturer, among other things. And currently, he is now district coordinator for Contra Costa County District 1. Did I get that all right? Yes, you did. All right. <laughs> OK, so when I reached out to Robert, though, I reached out as one public servant to another. And here's where I'm going to um, talk about libraries. Robert encouraged me to say something about public libraries, and so here I go. Um, I've heard that public libraries are referred to as universities for the people. And that's because uh, when we designate spaces like this as public goods, there is an intrinsic currency that we all benefit from when everybody in our community has free and equal access to these types of things. It informs the citizenry and therefore props up the democracy. And I very much see a through line between the press and public libraries. These are two very, very important institutions to our democracy. And so we're going to learn through these three weeks that they're very important, but engagement is everything. So just take a minute to look around. Go ahead, look around at your neighbor. You guys are the public in public libraries. For us to keep these institutions vibrant and doing what they should do, uh, we need an engaged public. So I'm going to take this opportunity to invite the Friends of the Livermore Public Library out to tell you how you can become more engaged. <laughs> All right, we got we got two friends, two friends for you this evening. <laughs> You're gonna have to hold the mic. I'm out gay. No, 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 no. Come on. <laughs> we actually have done this together before. You'd think we'd be more practiced, but we're not. Um, we are with the friends of the library. What do they do? Who are the friends? We sponsor events and. Some of you may have attended some of the jazz in July. I hope everyone is participating in summer reading. And we sponsor Black History Month and a ton of things that we all enjoy. And we pay for it. And like they say, there's no free lunch. So where does that money come from? <laughs> I'll let Dennis explain. <laughs> He's good with money. <laughs> um, yeah, let me give you a little bit of history on the Friends. Uh, we were formed in 1978 um, under the leadership of former Mayor John Shirley and a group of uh, little more presidents who were concerned uh, that with the passage of Proposition 13, the library's budget would suffer, uh, which it did. Uh, so. We established the Friends of the Livermore Library, which is a nonprofit 501c corporation, entirely run by volunteers. Nobody makes any money except for the library. Um, our mission is to raise funds for the library. And we do that three different ways. Uh, membership dues, donations, and sales of used books in our bookstore which you may have noticed is right off the lobby to the left as you enter the library. Uh, uh, they have a lot of uh, bargain books in there, and uh, you should check it out if you haven't before. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone here to become members of the Friends of the Library, and it's cheap. It's $10 a year. Uh, and with that $10, you get a membership card good for $10 worth of books at the bookstore. So it's 
a win-win. <laughs> so I would encourage anyone here who's not already a member of uh, Friends of the Library to pick up an application which is on the table as you, uh, there you go, as you leave tonight and uh, mail it in with your check for $10 uh, or more if you so desire. Uh, and I, I like to say, if you love the library, be a friend. <laughs> I like that. Um, you can also drop that off with your payment in the bookstore when the bookstore is open. When it's open. Or go online to friendsoflivermorelibrary.org. You can do it there through uh, credit card or PayPal. And we just happen to have next to the, um, the membership card a donation box. So, if you have any loose change or pesos or anything, just there's a convenient slot right on the top. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thought to thank Dennis and Janet and all the other friends who are here for making this possible. So, thank you so much. I'm going to point out a couple things before we get started. So, this is in case you haven't noticed, there's lots of cameras. So we are filming this. Um, so if you don't want to be on camera, I encourage you to move to the back. Um, and we can even move other chairs back there if you want to. If, if not, great. Uh, we do plan on posting this um, and using it for um, further education. So, um, and then also please just help yourself to the snacks and treats over here. Um, last but not least, um, we have a nice curated selection of books that pertain to what we're covering. So without further ado, please prepare to be wowed. Robert is a very, very good writer, but he's an even better speaker. Robert. Thank you so much, Emily. Well, I was going to praise Emily for her 100% accuracy the whole way until that end part when she set it up uh, to a degree that I'm not quite going to be able to meet. But thank you so much, Emily. I'll do my best. I'm really glad that you're all here. We're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to have not only my presentation, but hopefully a spirited discussion where I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback and being able to work through some of these ideas. Thanks so much to the Friends of the Library for your work, your presentation, and for what's going on. I firmly believe that the future is a threat to a grievous threat to our democracy in America and around the world uh, from threats both within and without. And the institutions that are the bulwarks against this threat are unquestionably in my mind institutions like public libraries, journalism, and other civic institutions that allow good people to come together as friends and pool resources, pool ideas, and fight for our democracy. The only reason this republic, this democracy, has been able to endure this long is because of people like you, and hopefully, like me, I endeavor to be on that level as well. And we must work together if we want to keep it. With that, I also want to say, uh, with regard to Emily uh, Lowell, I wanted to just tell a brief story about her. She's so wonderful. And she is a great library administrator now, but it was 20 years ago, almost, when Emily and I both began as young journalists at the San Bernardino County Sun and the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin. Um, she's remained young. I have done less so, but that's OK. And during that time, when we were coming in as young cub reporters, idealistic, ready to take on democracy, do what we could to support the public good, it was always drummed into our minds. Accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. Fairness, fairness, fairness. She's certainly got that still. We are going to do our best to meet that standard tonight. Uh, but if we take a few liberties, please let me know. Uh, a, by way of my background in journalism, uh, very briefly, uh, I remember my first job as an intern, and it was at the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin and then the San Gabriel uh, Valley Tribune. This is in L.A. County. And I specifically remember the summer when Ronald Reagan died, and that was, in, uh, that was June of 2004. And I walked into that newsroom that morning. It was a Saturday morning. And it was mostly empty, and the newsroom looked like they no longer look today. 
rows of dirty desks filled with detritus and dusty papers and all kinds of wrappers from the local takeout. And uh, interestingly, computers that were very deep and had black screens and green typeface on them. I know, the dinosaurs walked the earth too. And as I was there, that morning I was talking to an editor, a great man, his name was Phil Drake. And he said, I notice that you're very idealistic. You're working really hard. You believe in the public. You know, every story means so much to you. He said, let me tell you something. And he pointed out a woman who was working as the cops reporter that morning. And she had the scanner to one ear and the phone to the other. And she was ripping off another story. When I say ripping off, I mean uh, you know, dashing off. And he said, she's a great cops reporter. A few months ago, we sent her out to the scene of a homicide. And that was in a, they found a body in a dumpster in an alley. And it had been decomposing and it was this terrible, awful scene and someone had lost a son and a father. And she was right there on the scene and then she dispatched that story into the editors pronto. And it was him, he was the editor receiving the call. And he, she said to him, after all of the gruesome details were relayed with as much accuracy as possible, she said, on the way home, uh, on the way back to the office, I'm gonna stop by the taqueria and get some burritos. You want one? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, sure. And I'm sitting there sort of mouth agape. I don't really get it. I said, well, what's the punchline? He said, if you feel too much, all this is before the time when we talked about mental health and workplace health and so forth very much. He said, if you feel too hard, if you get invested in every single one, you're not gonna last. It's gonna break you down. You've gotta take a scientific impartiality sometimes to even the worst things. And I think that's part of what makes real professional journalists so important in our society. There's a lot of passion out there. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of people who think they know what's best for the world all the time. But do we have people who think that truth, capital T, is important as an investment in what they do and how they do it as a profession to provide people the kind of information that they need to make up their own minds. When we lose journalism, if we lose journalism, and we're losing it as we speak, we're losing that. We can have everybody on social media and everywhere else talking, so we're, but we're losing a real engagement. We're losing a profession that provides us, has always provided us, the meat and potatoes of our democracy. I don't know what a democracy looks like without that. Uh, one second anecdote would be six years later, uh, or no, I'm sorry, not six years, a couple years later, Emily was still there. We were at the San Bernardino County Sun. And San Bernardino was rife at the time with a terrible homicide tragic problem. There was really frightening numbers of people being killed in gang violence on a daily basis. San Bernardino was, vote, was uh, declared per capita the most dangerous city in the state of California, if not the country at that time in 2005. And then on one Thanksgiving night, right after we started, one Thanksgiving night in 2005, a family was having a lovely dinner inside of their stucco apartment building and someone came by and sprayed that with bullets. And a stray bullet struck and killed a small child. And it was a terrible tragedy, but in San Bernardino, there had been many children that year and years before who had been killed. But this was the difference. The editor and the publisher came in, they called a meeting, and they said, this is where we're gonna make a move as an institution. This is not gonna be just one more headline, one more sad story, one more picture, and then move on to the next day's carnage. We're gonna create a group called, and they called it Minesha's Circle. You can find it if you Google it. And we're gonna create this group and we're gonna demand stakeholders in all levels of our civic society. Government, private business, residents, neighborhoods, community groups, faith. And we're gonna to get together, we're gonna bring them all together and we're gonna say we have to do something. We have to say no more. And that's what they did. That's what we did. And in the coming months and years, there were more deaths. But that rate did get smaller. And people did walk the streets on their own volition and preach for peace and march for peace. And it became part of the culture. It became part of everything in our churches, our civic institutions. It became part of the conversation every day that, no, 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 
people being murdered in our disinvested communities is not something that we can just accept as part of our society. And that really made me fall in love with the power of journalism. To say objectively, not for profit gain or not for political power, but to say we want to do humans saying we want to do what we think is the right thing to do and let's do it together. That's only one in hundreds and thousands of stories over the course of history where institutions like newspapers have done exactly that. That's another thing, another power, another lever that we're going to lose if we lose institutions like this, like libraries, like journalism, like much more. Well, I hope not to disappoint anyone, uh, hoping that we were going to talk about all the G-Wiz technology today and how to navigate it better. We will do that. We'll, there'll be some preludes to it as well. But today, if you'll indulge me, but I promise it'll be riveting, we are going to go through a little bit of dusty history so that we can establish a foundation of understanding so that when we hit with the stuff, the tools of how to get better, how to be responsible citizens moving forward, we're going to be better equipped to use them. Now, with history, there's always the danger, of course. Uh, you know, to quote Hegel, uh, the one... The one great uh, German philosopher, the one great uh, lesson of history is that humans don't learn from history. <laughs> well, that's too bad, right? That's another way of saying history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes because we didn't learn our lessons as well the first time. But that doesn't mean that it can't be empowering moving forward, and I think it is. So let's start with reading a quote that I think is quite astonishing. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in the newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. Ooh, that's pretty rough. That's pretty dyspeptic. Anybody have an idea who said that? Was it, uh, I don't know, was it Elon Musk? I'm not sure, who, who said that? <laughs> Anyone know? Hazard a guess? It's okay. Oh, and by the way, just a uh, reminder on the Q&A, we're, we're gonna wrap the presentation um, and then we're gonna have a really lively Q&A. So if you could hold your questions toward the end, it'd probably be best. Uh, so, let's get the big reveal. My goodness, Thomas Jefferson. Note the date also. So, there's a cognitive dissonance here, right? We know that Thomas Jefferson is one of the great avatars of American democracy, freedom, uh, principal author of the Declaration of Independence, someone who believed deeply in his bones in the wisdom of the common man. And I say man on purpose because, of course, democracy at that time had not evolved uh, to include non-white males. Um, you know, as uh, terrible as that sounds, that was the time. And, uh, but he was always a proponent of free speech, the, the main driver of the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, right? Which, which explicitly uh, protects the power of the press as instrumental and, and absolutely integral to the sus sustaining of our democracy. How can he say, well, the date might tell you one thing, that's during his presidency and his second, uh, second year in office, or second term in office. So that's very important. And then more context, Jefferson wrote this. It was great, it, fascinating in my own research I've learned as well. Jefferson did this in response to a letter that had come from an aspiring editor and publisher in the new founding, recently founded country. And that editor and publisher asked Jefferson's advice as an eminent statesman and also an incredible explicator and philosopher of free speech and information. So he asked him, how can I make for a good newspaper? That's what he basically was asking. And Jefferson, in a moment of obvious uh, distress, said this. And I say distress because this is inconsistent with so much of what he said. But when we are in power, oftentimes the value of journalism becomes more opaque to us. So the key is that sometimes it seems that distrust in media, which is obviously on the rise, is a new concept, but it's not. But in many ways, distrust of information and distrust of the source could be at an all-time high. We don't have exact data to gauge what people thought survey-wise in the 18th century. But we do know today from a recent Knight Foundation study that 25%, 25% of those surveyed, 
it was a scientific study meant to be a cross-section of the country, 25% believed that mainstream news organizations try their best to get it right and give us the facts, give us trusted news. That's crucial. 25%, that's a low number. But even worse than that low number, in my opinion, is the belief about intent. It would be one thing if they said 25% believe that American media gets it wrong a lot, right? But when they say that 25% believe that American media actually tries to get it right, the 75% of Americans polled believe that the media is in on some kind of ruse to dismantle our ability to discern truth, right? Give us fake news, deliberately. The intent is so crucial. We're gonna revisit this concept over and over again. Understanding intent and our belief in intent is absolutely vital. And also, before I go further, I wanna say a little bit about um, another part of our program tonight. Uh, our intern, Andrew Melendez, is in the back, and he's gonna join us. He's done some really fascinating research also on some of these topics. He's gonna bring that with a new perspective. And Andrew Melendez is not only a scholar at St. Mary's College, but he's also the co-founder of a wonderful organization that's really close to my heart. And that organization is called uh, Bridge USA. And this is a college-based organization that aims at getting tomorrow's leaders and public servants on public campuses to understand the importance of working together in a bipartisan way to solve solutions, give solutions to our American uh, experiment, and to help us work forward in the future. Because we know that right now, that kind of energy is exactly what we need. And that's also why it's always worked. Because in America, we've always had this inclination to adapt and thrive to new situations. Problems come up, social institutions arrive to help address those problems. That's about freedom, that's about innovation. And that's one of the best things that we still have going for us. So with that, let's start with the founding of the, uh, the, not the founding, but let's start with the colonization of North America by European powers. What's crucial to keep in mind is that as the settlers came and started landing on these shores, the first 50 or 60 years or so, there was not a newspaper as we would normally understand it. They started with these sort of broadsheets, these one-page pamphlets that were like made out of parchment paper, very difficult to produce. Uh, the printing press technology was obviously in its infancy. And it took more than 50 years. And during that time, of course, the crowns in Europe, in Europe were very uh, adamant about not having this, right? passing laws, doing what they could to stamp out journalism before it really got its feet in America. And then in 1690, our first newspaper is published. And it was by an editor named Benjamin Harris. And this is something that's not known a lot. I think it should be a bigger part of our primary education. But basically, he came out with the first newspaper. And in 1690, he said, have editorial right on the front page. He said, what we're doing is trying to tell the truth the best we can. We'll make mistakes, but we're gonna correct those mistakes. We're gonna do other things too, but we need to give people information. He was filling a social and economic niche. So what happened? Well, his first issue was uh, naturally littered with falsehoods, including the particularly scandalous one of uh, the French king at the time had some inappropriate relationship with his stepdaughter, right? Which was a huge scandal back then. And naturally, the crown came in with both, the English crown came in with both feet and stamped him out after one issue, charged him with crimes, and put it into that newspaper. But what was interesting was both the telling the public and the endeavoring to do something better, but then right away lapsing into the false and sensational, right there at the beginning. It sort of is indicative of what we'll see over and over again, where disinformation and misinformation and free societies and free news are inextricably linked. They're intertwined in a way that we can't fully disentangle. But that doesn't mean that there's not a spectrum here where one side goes farther than the other. You probably know of this story in 1734 with John Peter Zanger. Uh, he was a prominent publisher, and this is still before the founding of, uh, of the American Republic. And he writes a bunch of scurrilous things about 
uh, or publishes, I should say, a bunch of scurrilous accusations about the colonial governor in that area. And he's promptly arrested, brought up, tried, arraigned. It's court time, right? And he's being uh, charged with very serious crimes. And he retains an attorney, a very famous attorney at the time, named Andrew Hamilton, not Alexander Hamilton. This is about, um, this is about a generation before. But Andrew Hamilton was a very able and very well-respected jurist. And what's crucial about this case is that in front of a jury, he argued that the truth about um, any political figure or anybody for that matter, the truth was an impregnable defense against libel. Now that didn't be immediately become a legal precedent. That, wasn't, that was something that was trampled on by future legislation, but it established a cultural precedent. You see, it's, it's also important to know that the American democracy at that time was totally new, was a totally new experiment. We didn't have a playbook to go by. There was nothing similar that had happened. Even in the incredible democracy that Greece was 2,000 years before, they still put Socrates to death for corrupting the youth with his speech, right? So American democracy and free speech as a defense against libel, truth as, against, as a defense against libel, totally unprecedented and also part of the greatness of the republic that would come afterward. And of course, the chaoticness as well. So what were those early newspapers like generally? Well, if you look at them, it's, all, it's often very, um, it's, it's, it's really incredible, it's surprising. A lot of it is just really, it would look like poor writing to us by our modern standards. And then of course, there's just a, a very small print, very difficult to read, and there's a lot of like basic information, you know, tonnage that's coming into ports and so forth, obviously calendar events and, and things of that nature. But then they also, more and more, this new technology began to be used for political ends as well. And it also gave birth to extremely powerful forces that were very consequential to the birth of our republic. People like Tom Paine, right, who is writing Common Sense as a serial in a newspaper, and it becomes a book, a pamphlet that changes the world, right? Would he have ever found an audience without a free press like the one that was in America? Absolutely not. Nor without one that had some level of protection based on free speech, the idea, against colonial um, governors or any other person in power from retribution. So you see the genesis of American democracy occurring right here with falsehoods and sloppiness right alongside riveting and powerful information, ideas that were revolutionary. This also, to put it in further context, is also around the time of the Enlightenment, right? Where, you know, people building on the ideas of Milton and others have this, now we would probably think is somewhat naive, but this idea that through the battle for truth, right, through the, um, through the interplay of falsehoods and others, this free speech will somehow always synthesize into something better, right? It'll always de facto equal a more just society, a closer examination of the truth. That whole Enlightenment idea, of course, came under uh, severe stress in the 19th century, but we won't get into that too much now. So, what's really crucial to also understand is that soon after the birth of the Republic, around Jefferson's time and then soon after, oh, and look at these genteel headlines, right? What a, uh, what a wonderful newsprint back then, uh, certainly impartial, uh, scientific, without passion, and so forth. But the early newspapers after the founding of the Republic were absolutely fierce partisan organs. That's what they were about. They weren't this idea of professional reporting, of giving people the facts, trusting your readers. That stuff wasn't really emerging yet. The new technologies, the papers reaching everyone was absolutely seized upon by the new political power in the country. Didn't know how to use it, didn't know the implications of it, but they knew they wanted it. And so Jefferson and Washington and, and, and Alexander Hamilton on the other side and many others, they basically waged a war in the press, right? There was no impartial understanding of what things are and the public essentially didn't know who to trust. It became what, what idea do we think is more persuasive? What party do we want to be with? And it's probably no accident that this level of partisanship endured well into the 19th and even into the 20th century. Partisanship in media. Partisanship in media as not a bad thing per se, but the right thing to do.
for the ideas of political parties to win out. So our media ecosystem for the first couple hundred years of our pre-republic and republic was very problematic. Right? Certainly not what we would wish for it to be today if we were examining it with our modern sensibilities. A big change comes with the 1830s. And this, this is when we enter the period of the penny press. So papers change from the 1790s, certainly before that as well, they change from party organs that are only available by subscription at a substantial cost. They're very much elite sheets that might trickle down to the, to the, the average folks. Certainly the ideas would. They're following their party masters to some degree. This is industrialization, and alongside of it, a democratization of information. Something very similar to what we're seeing today in some ways, right? History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So, drastic reductions in the the value and in the resources needed to make sheets, to make newspapers, and then a growing class of Americans who are able to read and write, a growing class of immigrants coming in as well. And then the big innovation here is in the 1830s, Benjamin Day of the New York Sun, New York becoming quickly the largest and most powerful city in the world, he innovates with the one cent paper. Everybody else follows suit. The, fa the, 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 the matter of Influence and power on American society can't be overstated by this one cent paper, right? Everyone gets to read it. It's open to everyone. And with that, the tenets of journalism and what works change along with the technology, right? There's, there's, a, there's a sense of economic materialism here where the conditions of production and what we have there is something that's going to allow a different way, a different social reality in the future. And so what's these newspapers look like? What do, they, what do they become after the, 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 the not so genteel but fierce partisan sheets of before? Now they become the place where you go for everything, first of all. There's no radio, no TV, no anything else. Imagine the power of papers. Most people can't afford books. The newspaper is everything, entertainment, information, how to think, how to feel, and all. And what do these publishers do? They learn right away. Sensationalism sells. Let's go with that, right? And when you look at some of these sheets back then, it's truly astonishing. Not only in what they produced, but what it ultimately, how it was received, right? Way, way different than today. So let's go, um, Andrew, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So the big one is the Great Moon Hoax, right? Now, that looks, has anyone seen that before? That looks really good. This is from 1835, and it was splashed across and a serial in the most popular newspaper in the, in the country at the time, the New York Sun. And so what this was, was with the editor's blessing, the reporter talking about a new astronomer with new tools, but that astronomer was away from the country and unable to, to respond he tells a story of we've discovered life on the moon, right? The moon is rife with life. And it includes all these great things, but the big kicker is the bat humans, right? Half human, half bat. They're, they're swarming all over the moon. Isn't this amazing? And so what happened, what, what do we think happened? The sun blew through the roof. They loved it. Circulation doubled overnight. The serial was a sensation that everybody wanted a piece of. It was fantastic. What did the rival newspapers do? Well, they did two things. They amped up their own disinformation, right? Their own storytelling. This is in pursuit of profit rather than political power. That's the big change at this time. Profit over political power. Although political power is still becoming, still, still an issue. And editors and publishers becoming political powerful, political powerhouses themselves as well but also all the other newspapers went to work trying to debunk this, right? And they did, right away, right? And what's really amazing about this episode is it fully played out. The sun went through the roof of circulation, stayed pretty high also, um, did not in any way lessen its solidified position as the greatest paper in the country, if not the world, in terms of circulation. But 
if you read about the feedback, and I did this in my research, it was incredible. Now, there's a possibility that there was a little bit of screening of what's coming through, but how do we gauge political and public feedback in 1835? Well, one of the best ways, where did the conversations that get recorded, where, were they, where did they occur? That special letter to the editor page. And in that, what did we get over and over and over again? People were like, they weren't mad about it. They thought it was basically a fun story. Thank you. That really made my day. You know? They learned that it was not true. They accepted that it was. Of course, some people didn't. Some people thought it was true. But, but there was a, a recognition by many that it wasn't true, yet they liked the sun for giving them this incredible entertainment, right? For juicing up their Sunday night or whatever it was. Think about that and the implications today, right? Certainly a different reaction, but some of the same primal understanding, some of the same primal effects and responses that we would expect. So uh, I'll also say the Penny Press, um, it made powerhouses of those editors and publishers. It was focused on the most sensational possible stories, oftentimes truth pushed to the side, even outright fabrication, and then also very uh, robust and fierce uh, political platforms. But typically not so much in service of party, but think about what's happening in the country. The country's becoming agrarian, it's going into urban. And people are massing in cities, and cities become the new hotbed of political power. And how you generate political power is by taking on issues within your city. And that's gonna grow in the progressive era that's soon to come. Uh, with that, let's move on to the next phase, which is yellow journalism. Now, some of you probably recognize these fine fellows here. And right before I get into that, I wanna just, um, just sort of succinctly state the thesis here, right? We see it in every phase of journalism, including today. There's an emergence of a new technology. There's a widespread adoption of that technology by the users of the technology and the consumers, the communications technology. There's this adoption that is widespread that really roots itself into our society and our culture. Then power is able to accumulate and ultimately there's a response to that power and how that manifests itself in that communication. There's a democratic backlash if the system's working properly, right? That's us, right? Saying no, saying there's a problem here. Then in response to that democratic backlash, there's an emergence of new technologies, new adoptions, new media, and then we begin the cycle over again. That's what's happened before. Will it change in the future? Possible. There's, there are some elements of technology today and tomorrow that are gonna be fundamentally different, more powerful, more scary, than what we've seen before, even in context. But the general precepts seem to hold. So with that um, exciting time, this is the apogee, if you will, of yellow journalism and the penny press as well. We have Pulitzer on the right and Hearst on the left. Um, this occurs in the late 19th century, early 20th century. This is really fascinating because you see these two men, um, they are more alike than different in many ways. On the one hand, you have Pulitzer, comes to America, a penniless Hungarian immigrant with no English language skills, but a tremendous drive and ambition to be something, be somebody. And he arrives in St. Louis, which was a hotbed of an enclave of folks of his culture and background. And like many people at that time, he scrounged up a few dollars and newspapers were rising and falling all the time in, in, in our big cities. And people could snap him up and he did at a really cheap price, you know, really gambled at it. But he turned his St. Louis Post-Dispatch into a model for journalism to come. It was really special. And what he did was basically a distillation of what I already said, which is this combination of fervent, populist, progressive editorials pointing out urban ills, helping the people, he would say, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And at the same time, sort of, sort of contrasting that noble and powerful voice for the people with uh, increasingly sensationalist stories. Right? He knew right away, you know, crime was one of the things that he really used a lot of. And that was a great opportunity for storytelling, right? We love those kinds of stories. Um, we always have, he had an insight into what humans like in our stories. 
And that, he was a real innovator in that respect. So he takes his profit, his power, his prestige, and he takes it to where everybody goes when they become a big success in the 18, uh, by then it became, uh, I believe, the 1870s, to New York City. And then he buys the world, which is this incredible building here. Unfortunately, it's been since demolished. It's gone. What a, what a shame. Um, you see the old pictures online, and they're pretty fascinating architecture. That, was, that by the way, was Newspaper Row, um, which was the most powerful part of New York at the time. And he made his world the greatest paper in the world, right? The most powerful one, the biggest one. Pulitzer, in addition to all of his other foibles, was a manic worker, a sickly man, who literally drove himself to death um, with time. As before that, drove himself to blindness, blindness and so forth. Hearst, on the other side, California boy. Grew up right here. Literally a silver spoon scion. Seems like a big contrast to, Hearst, or to Pulitzer, right? Hearst, I say literally because he was born of a wealthy Nevada silver miner who had become phenomenally rich by striking the mine. He was a crude, um, uneducated man, the, the older Hearst. And he also bought his way to a Senate seat back when you could do that in the 19th century. It wasn't a popular vote back then. You just greased all the top party officials. He got, was a senator. And so that led to Hearst having an unlimited war chest. So Hearst, tall, baby-faced, of a robust constitution, in so many ways so different than Pulitzer, but similar in the sense of the driving ambition and the belief in journalism and the power of story, a fanciful belief that he wanted to change the world and he wanted to do it with stories. Now, it might have been to less noble ends, and we'll hear about that more. But this circulation war, what these two did, they, set, they cast the die that would really be for decades to come, and it's really still with us today. It's amazing, the parallels, when someone thinks about Hearst and his biography. We'll go into that more, but think of the parallel between Hearst and a Rupert Murdoch today. They're pretty striking if you really examine it. With that, I'd like to bring up Andrew, who's done a lot of research on this topic, to come break this up and you know, give us some tidbits that really help us understand. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. How are you guys doing tonight? Hello. All right, I just want to make sure. Is this microphone working good? I might. Great. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. And this will sound a little better, too. There we go. So, yeah, I guess my goal here um, and a lot of the research that I've been doing recently is just trying to kind of figure out how exactly we got from this point of yellow journalism to what we see today. And so, as I've learned, and I think this is something we're really starting to allude to here, is that the era of sensationalism and media bias and fake news that we see today can really be attributed back to the impacts of these two men and the legacies that they created and the visions that they had for news and information. But before we delve into that, I kind of want to go a little bit in detail about the beginnings of Pulitzer's career and how exactly we got to this point here. So surprisingly, when Pulitzer first started with his world, he was actually someone who was a very, very fervent proponent of hard-hitting, factual journalism. And I love that quote that you used, Robert. He was someone who wanted to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I love that so much. <laughs> he saw the poor sanitation, the corruption, the injustices around his community, and he used his paper to alleviate those and bring to light what was going on. Now to try to make some reference to what we see today, I mean, of course, we see investigative journalists who, in the pursuit of truth, will use their same papers and their same investigative skills in order to pursue knowledge the same way that Pulitzer did. And even outside of just newspapers, we see social media activists, people who use their online presence in order to spread awareness about what's going on today. So we're kind of seeing how these you know, ideas start to correlate among one another. And for Pulitzer, this was really great. You know, he was fine doing this kind of journalism. But of course, it would all change once Hearst came onto the scene with an abundance of wealth, tons and tons of resources. And he would come in. He would poach Pulitzer's staff. He would buy them off and bring them to his journal. He would copy his style and then ultimately make a new form of journalism, which was not one that was about hard-hitting factual journalism. He didn't want to afflict the comfortable or comfort the afflicted. 
He wanted to make sensational stories that would drive profits and drive fame to his paper. And when Pulitzer found out about what's going on, he would too stoop to this level in a pursuit of power and fame. He would go down to Hearst level and he would loosen that grasp, that gra sorry, he would loosen that grasp of journalistic integrity that he had held onto for so long. And I'll give you an example of just how this happened. There was a young reporter who came onto the scene and her name was Nellie Bly. And she was hired on to William Hearst's team, or sorry, she was hired on to Pulitzer's team and she was given one task. And that task was for her to sneak into a mental institution, pretend to be a mentally insane woman and describe in detail in an article for the world about how exactly what was going on inside that mental institution. So it seems pretty crazy, and it really was back then as well. But the readers, I mean, they had never seen anything like that before. They, they gravitated towards this paper, and it was the first time that they really got to see how the sensationalized news really just captivated their minds. And we still see this today. Like you said, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And I'll give you an example right here. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Project Veritas, but this is an online activist group, far right. And they do the same, same tactics that Nellie Bly did. They would um, go around, uh, get secret recordings of different people, and they would basically twist the words of what's going on in order to create misinformation and propagate news that you know, follows a political agenda, whether or not it's true. Like I said, history repeats. History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And as we look back to the story of Nellie Bly, it becomes clear to Pulitzer and Hearst that by manipulating and appealing to the fears and prejudices of readers, they'd be able to drive circulation far much more than what any other kind of factual journalism could have ever presented. And of course, the same reality was as relevant then as it is today. As we look at things like social media algorithms, these things are designed to keep users engaged and they often reinforce existing beliefs and biases using the same kind of sensationalized stories that existed then, including now fake news. And this leads to the creation of echo chambers and polarized communities. And so as we look back into the, you know, the grand scheme of the 19th century, we can really sum this up, this entire era up into two things. It was an era of not only national imperialism, but also media imperialism as well. And it was a point where Hearst could credibly write, and I quote, the force of the newspaper is the most powerful force in all of civilization. Newspapers declare wars and they can make and unmake statesmen. Now, of course, this would be proven to be true during the events of the Cuban Revolution in 1895. Hearst at the time, he wanted war. He wanted war for profits, war for adventure, war for his own personal fancy. And so by doing that, he would hire editors and writers that would come in and write false news that would basically try to, you know, change the entire consciousness of the, of the American public into supporting a war against Spain. And of course, we still see this today. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Modern media outlets make millions of dollars each year producing fake news that only further divides, misinforms, and confuses the American public into believing the falsehoods that are produced from shady business practices, ultimately designed to keep readers engaged and afraid. And this inadvertently leads to the rapid spread of misinformation and false narratives that only further the distrust in news today. But this misinformation and this confusion, it was exactly what Hearst wanted back then. His goal overall was to coerce the American public and its U.S. leaders into war against Spain. He was going to use the journal to make that happen. And if he were able to make that happen, then he would make the journal the most powerful newspaper in the entire world. So I'll finish off with just this last quote here. And I think you'll find this really interesting. 
Hearst, uh, he famously wrote to a, an, il an illustrator in Cuba who had called in, let him know that there was no war going on, there was nothing going on here. And he would tell him, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it back on to Robert. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, brilliant. You do a really great work. It heartens me when I see young people like Andrew, scholars of St. Mary's College, working with everything they have, believing in America, believing in our future, and doing what they can to establish a new norm moving forward. This is the kind of emerging technology and then response that we need today. And when I see that kind of thing, again, my confidence grows. So a couple of quick takeaways that are very important. Uh, number one, Nelly Bly versus Project Veritas, right? Really key, right? What's the difference? There's the questionable ethics of the methods, but Nelly Bly, what was her intent? Right? What was she trying to do? Expose corruption to hurt people, right? To try to do something that was going to let the truth be told, though the heavens may fall, what Nelly Bly would say, right? It didn't matter about party or partnership was all. This other example, Project Veritas, arguably very much in service of a political agenda, right? That's the difference between news. It's intent. That's the difference between disinformation and misinformation. Misinformation is when my mom or my sister or whoever else, my friend, inadvertently shares something on social media that's not true out of the best of intentions. Disinformation is when some sophisticated actor uses the most latest tools, powerful tools, of persuasion and propaganda in order to try to change the way we think and often to topple governments or even create new realities around us. Well, this era, the apogee was sharp. Yeah, they played a huge role in the war in Spain and uh, the, the dawn of American imperialism, for good or for ill. It's also very interesting when you look at the past, how the Spaniards viewed the kind of stuff that was in American media at the time. They were perplexed, they had no idea. How could this happen? Like, all these papers, because they were talking about the Spaniards being beastly and torturing you know, women and children and all these really outlandish things that, you know, I mean, I'm not saying they were good guys, but at the same time, they were, they were an occupying force of colonialism, but they were always perplexed by how does the American government, how does this powerful nation allow these papers to say these things? They didn't get it, right? Nobody quite gets it. That's the power of the idea of free flow of information, free speech, no matter what comes with that. So, as we move out of this, right, that was the object. The Dale May was swift, right? His uh, paper, The World, was gone by eight, uh, 1931. Uh, Hearst, of course, lived much longer and earned much more infamy in his life. Uh, Pulitzer, probably out of uh, guilt over his participation in all of this, uh, went on to use his depleted fortune to endow the Columbia School of Journalism to create a professional journalism class, right? To do what was right in journalism. And that was an important innovation. And it also helped to usher in the new era, which would be what we would call uh, the professional era, right? A maturation of media, I would call it. In some ways, a real high point in American society and in journalism. In other ways, a point that is you know, much to be lamented, where there's a lot of um, improvements to be made. But what's crucial is that as the new post-war consensus emerged, newspapers had a few things going on. On the economic side, what we had was a consolidation of papers and also an emergence of chains, right? wire services. So this was a standardization process that improved efficiency and brought information around the world. That's a good thing. Also improved a, a sort of professional and a very uniform standards in news writing. Good thing, perhaps, right? But on the other hand, sucked resources out of local newspapers, reduced local newspapers' autonomy, reduced local content, right? It was a homogenization of information to some degree. Now, one could argue that played a tremendous role in developing the American post-war consensus. Maybe it did. But on the other hand, it definitely drastically reduced the diversity of voices that could be available in American society. Even in many ways it was retrograde. It was worse than the decades before, right? At least then, 
we had wilder ideas moving around. And the growing immigrant populations in the cities were writing in letters to the editor. That was a feedback opportunity. The post-war consensus of the maturation period was different in that respect. However, there was something very special that happened as well. Journalism really grew as an institution in American society. And this really, um, you know, think about it like this. Think about, think about Joseph McCarthy, right? Many of you may know who this is. Um, this was someone who created political power in the early 50s amidst the scare over communism and nuclear weapons. And he made a lot of accusations about people that were untrue, calling them communists, saying communists were infiltrating our whole system of government. His power was such that other politicians either pulled away or pulled alongside, but were definitely uh, not hastening to come and call him out, right? Because they didn't want that back. They knew the support that he was gathering. Sound familiar today, perhaps? And so what happened? What was the ultimate end of Joseph McCarthy? Well, there are other factors as well. I'm oversimplifying, but a big one would absolutely be Edward R. Murrow, right? Venerated journalist and newsman, trusted man in America, in many ways kind of a precursor to the Cronkite that is even more famous. But Murrow used his prestige, used his reputation, put it on the line to say, no, I'm gonna take this on. This is against the wishes of his editors, his publisher, his, his news network, right? You've probably seen the movie, Good Night and Good Luck. It's a, quite a riveting film. And he took McCarthy on. McCarthy was never the same. Now, there are other factors in McCarthy's demise, but what Murrow did was special. And that is, especially, that is the kind of thing that we are missing today, right? Who could step up and be unimpeachable? Who could say, no, that's wrong? That's not true. And I'm gonna debunk that, and I'm gonna pull the rug out from under power, power person A or B. That's what we've lost. That's not just Edward R. Murrow as a trusted man, newsman, it's the loss of power as journalism as an institution. Now, other things are happening at this time. There's emergence of new technologies, television, radio, and so forth. That's gonna uh, begin to erode the power of, of newspapers. But also, legislatively, things are happening, like the 1964 case of Sullivan v. New York. This is when we finally come full circle from Andrew Hamilton in the 17th century, and we finally we put it down bedrock in law that truth is not only a defense against libel, but let's go farther. Intent to tell truth is a defense against libel. The only way that you can be sued for libel is, well, you can be sued no matter what, but the only way you can lose is if someone can prove that you intended to lie and injure. So what is that? That's an extremely high bar of protection for our First Amendment, for our news press, for information in general. For good or for ill, it's a very high bar. Now, that doesn't mean it's not across. Sometimes it does. There's a case with the voting machines, for instance, that is using that same legislation. So let's go to the high point, and that would be um, absolutely the Watergate scandal. Right? This is really important um, only in the sense that this marks another pinnacle of journalism before another denouement. Right? Look at uh, our, our heroes here, and they absolutely were thought of as heroes. Right? And this incredibly popular film comes right after. I mean, the, the nut and bolt of it is these two truth tellers, Right? That's what they intended to do. And they were just average reporters. They didn't even have, they, they had little respect in their own profession. There's a real, a, real, um, a real David and Goliath tale, right? But only made possible by the institution of journalism. But they topple a president for uh, lies and for criminal behavior, right? And without them, almost surely, Nixon's res resignation would have never occurred, whether you agree with it or not. It's the demonstration of the power of journalism. And then Hollywood takes hold, and we have Redford and Hoffman, and they are heroes. And this, the big apogee here is that newspapers have all of the studies that we have. We do have data for this period. They show trust in media institutions at all-time highs in the mid to late 70s. Americans believe what Cronkite tells them, what the Washington Post tells them, what New York Times tells them. And not only do they believe it, this industry is thriving as well, right? In many exciting ways. People 
what's the coolest profession in 1977, right? It, it, one of them is definitely investigative reporter. People want to do that. And it also brings in diverse voices, which we didn't have before. Very exciting, right? People of different minority communities, different ethnic communities. Uh, of course, women make a huge dive into journalism at this time. And just talented young people in general want to be journalists. Journalism's riding high. And what do we know about when industries and cultures and institutions ride high like this? What comes next? <laughs> Sadly, right? We know what's coming. With that, um, before I do that, let's watch that clip really quick. Could we please? I love that. Um, there's a lot to talk about there. Maybe we could do that in some q and I'll just say a couple quick things um, aside from Jason Robard's tremendous performance, which is wonderful. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot to be concerned about there with our modern eyes, our modern stabilities, our, our understanding of society, right? Essentially, when I, if I strip away all the color in the beautiful Hollywood, we have a, a group of white males sitting around in, in the 1970s deciding what America should know about news, right? Because it wasn't just the Watergate thing, they're talking about 20 other, 50 other, whatever, right? And that was replicated in newsrooms across the country every day, right? Obviously very problematic. However, on the other side, there's two things to really note. One, the power, right? Journalism, what we're doing, it has stakes. This means something. It's worth doing. And we can do it and people can trust us because what we say is of consequence. And number two, Back to the intent, right? So much imperfection there. So many problems, so much we gotta progress from. However, with all, that, with all that talking, with all that concern, with whatever else, what was there at the basic core? Humans trying to do what they thought was best, right? With this powerful tool they had, that being the printing press and the attention they get. That's powerful. Do we have that kind of discussion occurring today among Facebook's boardroom, right? Or, or X's or Twitter's, right? No, we don't, we don't. We still have it at the New York Times and it's more diverse, better in many ways, but it's not quite as influential. And that's a question, that's a problem. That intent is crucial. Now, uh, I won't go into the, de the denouement too much, but as we know, um, after journalism rides high, uh, the 80s and 90s up to today is continuing a slide downward in many ways, right? What happened? How did we lose what we had, right? Well, I mean, a very specific example might be something like, I, it was a cautionary tale when I was in journalism school uh, 20 years, more than 20 years ago, and that would be at this very same paper, Janet Cook at the Washington Post, right? Wins a Pulitzer Prize in 1982 or 83 for her story about Jimmy's World, the nine-year-old heroin addict and drug dealer, 
right? That, that uh, you know, is, is hopelessly addicted to heroin and also some kind of kingpin riding roughshod on his neighborhood. Incredible story. I actually have read it a few times. It's tremendous writing. It was just totally fiction. And that wasn't acceptable at that time. And that was a massive scandal for the Washington Post. It was a massive scandal for journalism in general. Whereas in 1976, there could be a movie called All the President's Men that wins all the awards, it gets all the box office. By 1982 or 83, there's a movie called Absence of Malice with Sally Field, which is itself a huge hit with Paul Newman as well. And what's that all about? That's about journalists leaving their ethics aside on the hunt for prestige and power and fame, ruining lives through their tawdriness and tabloid uh, exploitation. That's where journalism goes in just a few short years. In 1987, the FCC abolished the Fairness Doctrine that opened up the space, of course. There was no longer a requirement for stations to provide equal time to equal sides. It's a sort of a deregulation of the communications industry. We're gonna go into that in more detail, by the way, in the next piece. And of course, massive fragmentation and decline of traditional news, right? Our local news, I don't need to tell you, has been decimated. And we don't know what that model looks like to, to, to fix that. We don't know what's gonna step into that vacuum. We know what's in it right now. Next door, Facebook. This is problematic, right? We need to figure out new solutions. And my guess, another prelude for the future, uh, these big companies are gonna have to be part of the solution because they're just too big. Right? How do we get them to be part of the solution? Is it, is it democratic power and possibilities pulling them by the nose? Or is it self-regulation? There's gonna be technological innovations that have to play a role as well. I'll get into that all in the next piece. But we are gonna need some serious change. And I'm confident it'll come. Now, just to sum up, we saw the various phases of journalism, where it went. Um, today, we have a lot of shoots of positivity that I'm really excited about, right? Universities across the country, including one right down the street here at, um, I believe in Santa Clara. Yeah, Santa Clara University's Makula Center. There's Stony Brook in New York. Many more that are establishing institutes for truth in news, professional news gathering, right? Addressing the social ill that we have today, because it's a significant one. Finding that niche and finding an opportunity to make it better. What will news gathering look like in the future? What's gonna be a value? See, when this was happening, suddenly sensationalism, maybe for an all too brief a period, sensationalism, lies, storytelling, those became, they went from de rigueur to uh, no, no, no thank you, right? This was something that was very much against. The whole measure of journalistic effectiveness at this time was understood to be accuracy objectivity, investigation, unearthing truths that we couldn't otherwise have, right? There's a space for that today, and it could be an exciting space, but right now it's being swamped by the incredible profusion of misinformation, disinformation, fake news. Uh, we, we've defined the terms, but they're all, they're all sort of winding together. So, please go back up to the old model if you could, um, Andrew. That's the model that I believe holds uh, with all of the, um, it's, a, it's a conceptual model to understand what we've seen in the past and likely um, some iteration of what we'll see in the future. But I think that suffice to say the history's lesson uh, for us is that journalism is vital to who we are as a people and a nation. It's been there since the beginning, drastically imperfect, various permutations, and this is one of those as well. Journalism has faced crises that have seemed insurmountable before. It's had its ebbs, its flows. But that journalism, like our country, like people, like the public, have always adapted and endured and come up with new solutions to new problems. Now, the solutions, the ideas, they're less important than the intent, just like with disinformation. We have to want to believe that we are all consequential, that we play a role. Your news diet, what you consume, what you know, what you think, how you share that with other people, which to a greater degree than ever occurs in cyberspaces and will more so in the future. All of that means that we as citizens have a greater responsibility than ever before 
to be part of a healthy news ecosystem and a healthy environment and a healthy democracy. I do firmly believe that our democracy is under siege right now. I think that in the coming years, we are gonna face really scary technologies that are going to test our metal and demand a response. I'm talking about AI, uh, it, it, none of you didn't think that. Um, AI with communications and social applications. Uh, I think 2024 is gonna be a scary time and beyond. And so we need to gird ourselves uh, personally and professionally and support institutions like our libraries, our schools, our journalism, and act in a way that makes us responsible news consumers and sharers. Now I got a whole tool belt that I wanna give everybody um, in the next chat, and that'll be next Wednesday. And, um, and also we'll, we'll you know, explore where we are today and some of the various scenarios for the future. I'm really excited about that. But most important, I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight and being willing to listen and understand and you know, feel a little bit of our dusty history of journalism in this country. Because I think that that was, I think that was a rich foundation for us to really be able to understand, comprehend, and ultimately, most importantly, be inspired and empowered for today and tomorrow. So with that, I promised a robust Q&A session, if you'd like that. We do have 20 minutes. Um, obviously, people, please grab, a, grab snacks, grab refreshments. I also, I failed to point out, I know that Emily already did, but tremendous job curating that journalism education over there. Uh, love those books, great stuff. Um, you know, if you, if you could read just one, we could, um, we could, all, make a, we could all make a dent in this. Um, but yeah, news consumer education, crucial. And I'm gonna be talking about that a lot um, in the next one. So with that, I wanna thank you all again. I've really enjoyed this time. And I want to invite uh, some questions and let's, let's have a chat. Uh, please, I guess, raise, raise your hands and we'll, uh, we'll bandy them about. Uh, let's start with up front. Maybe we'll do the, maybe we'll applaud for all of us at the very end of this. <laughs> Go right ahead. You talked about San Bernardino. Yeah. Uh, the murder rate in San Bernardino. I, I, I'm one of the few people in my neighborhood who takes the local paper. You cannot look at the East Bay Times uh, local section without a laundry list of shootings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did it in San Bernardino. What's the model they can do it in Oakland? I think that's a great question. And I think that what it requires is it requires courage and it requires um, being willing to take a little bit of a risk, right? And it requires things like local control and agency. You see, at the San Bernardino County Sun, this was the pre-Alden Capital period. Uh, that, that means the big hedge fund that bought the paper. And so the editor and the publisher were local folks. And they decided that they believed in their community they wanted to do this, right? So there was a lot to do that didn't necessarily have a direct impact on circulation or profits, at least initially. It of course increased the trust brand, the strength of the institution in my opinion, but those are difficult things to measure. What would I do if I was the editor of the Contra Costa Times, which by the way I used to work at and uh, loved it very much. I covered the city of Richmond, by the way, which is uh, not too far from San Bernardino in some ways. I went from San Bernardino to Richmond. I, obviously I have a knack for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I live in, by the way, I live in Richmond today, I raised my family, I have three small children, and you know, it's a terrific place. But, I believe in my community, I wanna work for it. To answer your question directly, what, would, what should we do? Well, I think that it's clear that what they're thinking is the stories about crime, murder, mayhem in Oakland, that's something that people in the suburbs wanna read, right? And that's true, it, it, sometimes they do. But there's also a fatigue on that. And that fatigue is like this idea of what are you doing? Why, why are we just spectators? Where is the innovation, right? Retelling some, crime story in some way that it's almost, it has this sort of, especially today when we all feel as though we can be part of solutions, which is a good thing by the way, it has this, this smack of nihilism, right? Where it's like, we're just reporting it, you know, we're not there. But the, the problem is the energy and the will to do something different, to experiment, to try something. What I would do is I would do something like similar to what Sam Renier did. I say, we're gonna make a crusade at this newspaper to save lives. 
especially save the lives of folks that are growing up in East Oakland or, North, or, or West Oakland or whatever. I would do that because I think it's the right thing to do and I think that my readers would ultimately appreciate it. The problem is, I don't know what the leadership looks like there. I, I'm guessing, my guess is the leadership really is totally beholden to the capital group that owns them wherever they are. You know. There you go. And what does the capital group, what do they want um, out of their newspaper? Just keep selling a few more. Give, give a few more profits on your way down the hill. Thank you for that great question. Yes, please. I'd be interested in your thoughts about what I've heard recently. I want to say Kansas, but somewhere in the Midwest, this small little paper with the investigative reporting that the town mayor leadership didn't like, and now they've done search warrants. What's your thought about that? Wow. Well, so I'm not familiar with that story per se, um, but my first thought is, oh yeah, now is the time to fight, right? Great opportunity. If I, I, as a journalist, and I know Emily believes in this also, I would love to be on the front lines of that, right? I want to go in there and I want, to, I want to battle for the truth. And I want to say, you know, corrupt politicians can't take me down, right? But my thoughts on this generally, globally, not knowing anything about it, it sounds like conceptually an illness of the weakness of newspapers, right? Where, now granted it could have happened 100 years ago too, but in today's news environment, newspapers, journalists, and so forth, all of it, as an institution, as an individuals, are at a, a low point, at a nadir, in terms of their public perception, right? What people think about them. Now political leaders play a big role in this, right? When talking about press as the enemy of the people and so forth, They've helped to kick this down, but they're not the only ones. Some of this is journalism, journalism's own doing, right? Its own failing has led to this. I think we have to have some responsibility for this ourselves. But my guess is, number one, uh, I'd love to be there and battle that. Number two, um, journalists tend to be a really righteous, really truth-telling lot. Those who choose to live their lives, especially at local, low-paying papers, just all we have when we're doing, Emily knows this, all we have when we're working at that local newspaper, we're working really long hours, we're getting paid hardly anything. All we have is our belief in what we're doing, right? The integrity, it's powerful. It really, it's passionate. So it's great, it's great for younger people too, you know, before you have a family and all that. People really believe it, you need that. And then lastly, um, you know, my guess is that um, what's happening there, the, the, the history of political power cracking down on newspapers, telling things that they don't want them to say, uh, is well-trod ground, and as we saw, it started with Jefferson in our presentation tonight. Jefferson, the avatar of free speech, how powerful it is, how important it is. Jefferson, a president, saying, oh, that polluted vehicle. I want to get rid of that, right? Now, in fairness to Jefferson, long after he leaves office, in fact, Andrew, can you pull up that slide? Long after he leaves office, oh, I'm sorry, before he goes into office, sorry, I hope he got better when he got out of office, uh, before he was in office, look what he's saying, right? Before he's a president. Let me just do it. Were it left to me to decide whether I should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate for a moment to prefer the latter. That's the newspapers without government. But I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. But by the way, that second part, that's what's so important for our next session. Thank you for that great question. I thought I saw some hands over here before I pulled. Um, I didn't mean to overlook you. Where was the hand over here, please? OK. Um, anyone? Yes. So um, the ends justify the means. Maybe Nellie Bly was trying to help you know, patients in mental hospitals. And so maybe she cherry pick the data that she used in, in, her, um, in her stories. Uh, was she adhering to journalistic values or was she, well, what, you know, what would she have been doing? Tremendous question, right? And this, this is why journalism, like philosophy, like life, this is not a question for ChatGPT. This is not a question for bots, right? Robots don't have this agency yet but they will, and we'll talk about that, uh, which is the scary part. But journalistic ethics, right, is a tremendously fascinating and fertile ground to talk about. Now, 
I'll give you my own opinion, but there is no right answer. This isn't math, right? So my own opinion would be, uh, yeah, to some degree, the ends did justify the means in that case. Now, I haven't reviewed every word that Nellie Bly wrote in, the, in that uh, expose, but what I do know is that at that time, there was a rampant amount of disgusting abuse of our mentally ill and others in New York City, right? And there was no accountability, no oversight, no anything. And the institutions that were doing this to these humans were not only beyond accountability, but they weren't answering any questions. So I do know that Nellie Bly resorted to this, uh, this cloak and dagger approach to get to a truth that she felt she couldn't get to otherwise. So in other words, she lied and she masqueraded and she dissembled in order to get her story. That sounds pretty bad, but you said the ends justify the means. Maybe they do, right? I, I'm not a Kantian, I don't think any newspaper person is, where we think exactly we know what the precept is for how to act in a given situation. On balance, did what Nellie Bly did do under the auspices of the New York world at the time, on balance, was that a good thing? Yes. I cert my opinion is it was. Did it set a dangerous precedent? Yes. Um, is it something that journalists and editors should always take an extreme amount of care and caution before they endeavor to do in the future? Absolutely. Is it similar to some of the stuff that we talked about we referred to earlier? No, right? Not in service. The question is intent. Why? Why are we doing this, right? The journalist says, I need to find out the truth because the public deserves the truth. And when the truth is told, things will change. Such a powerful idea. Such a rare idea. Today, we have a lot of people that are saying, I don't care about the truth. I need to get the information that's gonna further my political agenda, or the information that's gonna further my profit, right? That's the, on, that's the social media influencers, and that's the social media uh, partisans. And they're really, they have a platform, I'm getting ahead in the next lecture a lot here, but they have a platform they've never had before. And it's really destabilizing. So, uh, to go back to your question, the ends justified the means? I believe so, in that time. I think the intent is vitally important. I think that when you see stuff like the Watergate folks talking in that editorial meeting, that's so powerful because they're doing, they're humans doing their best in support of a righteous cause. I think Nellie Bly was doing that too. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, there are so many sources of information these days. It seems more than ever. You mentioned so many. From newspapers to TV to social media to magazines to uh, podcasts, you name it. Uh, and then there's all this disinformation. And you say, you know, you worry about democracy. I totally agree. But what is the average citizen really supposed to do? I mean, they're, they're, it's easier enough to find a source that agrees with your worldview. <laughs> And so if you think you are educated, informed, um, you tend to go to the media outlets that you trust. Mm -hmm. and, and in some sense, they then validate you know, your world your worldview and how you should be thinking of it, about a particular situation. That is also true of people who uh, go to what we probably would call not so reputable uh, uh, sources that pander in what, you know, what their political base may want to hear and that kind of thing. How do you cut for that? I, you'll probably get into it in the next week. But it's a fundamental problem. I mean, it's, it's easy to talk about in some sense, but it's darn hard to know how to sort it out. Well, that's a tremendous question. That's what we're here for. And let's stay tuned until next time. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a few, uh, but there will be more. Um, yeah, absolutely. What a powerful... Here's the thing. Humans, we haven't changed, right, very much in the last 100,000 years. You know, evolution moves very slowly. Technology moves very fast. We still have the same brain we had 500 years ago and 1,000 years ago. But what we deal with today is something that we could have never imagined. We certainly aren't evolved for. And that makes us vulnerable. 
What is more powerful than being told that you're right? Being told that what you believe about something is the right way to go. Having that reinforced back at you over and over again. Click it, click it, click it, click it. It's a, it's a hit of dopamine for me every time. I'm so smart. This is telling me exactly what I want. Oh, and it makes me angry too, right? And I, I need that too. That's that juice, right? And today, we, that, that's the challenge, right? On the one hand, the gatekeepers of information before decided what we, wanted to he, what, what we needed to hear. That's bad in some ways. But in other ways, it protects us from ourselves because now we are our own gatekeepers. And we're able to curate either wittingly or unwittingly, right? We can do it wittingly by like following the right list, going to the right group, doing these things, right? Which we do. But usually that's in combination with unwittingly algorithms developing and curating for us without our knowledge. The algorithm already knows you better than you know yourself. It knows me better than I know myself. It knows what I want to buy, how I feel. It's gonna get, it's gonna get more, it's gonna get crazier, more strong, more insidious in some ways, right? <coughs> Will it take over our minds? Right? We, gotta, we gotta get into that. But what we need to do now is we need to be cognizant of this, right? We, it, this goes with everything in life. How much can we not be led around by our primal impulses, right? It's easy to just click on what we wanna click on all the time. It's harder to be a rational, an educated news consumer who curates themselves in a way that provides diverse sources of information and creates a, a, a sense of a firewall against that algorithm that's seeking to just get you outraged, intensified, and ultimately just staying on the platform. We're gonna get into all of that with more tools, but the, the, the brief answer to your question is we need to do something to ensure that our news is diversified horizontally. And I'll get into that a lot more. I hope that's enough for that answer at that time. I didn't wanna, thank you so much. There'll, there'll be more if we come next, next Wednesday. is something that just has to be uh, looked at in a different lens. Yeah. So whether it's our evolution or not, but um, I think always fearing the next technology doesn't really lend us to looking at how do we create depth of thinking and how do we make sure that, um, you know, human emotion is part of these stories because as you can see, quantity of stories, you start to lose like the impact, which is probably helpful when it comes to writing about things, but I think all of us will become more desensitized. I mean, I when I started college, email was the new thing. I got to email my friends back home, and that was so exciting. Um, and now I have so many emails from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep that I don't about email anymore, right? I mean, and that's just in the span of 20 years, right? So, um, 25 years, but I guess the question really is like, how do we put a quantifier on certain things to help people look at depth and look at speed so that they can get what they need in depth at the speed that we're, we're operating at right now? Because uh, leaving Leaving this country and coming back to this country, I see that the American culture is really sped up to like a text, a text culture, which is like very short content and depth. And maybe that's how we're going to continue. Well, it certainly raises vulnerabilities, right? Such a profound series of questions. They've all been. So much to unpack there. Now, we're just about at eight. I'm going to wrap this really quick, and then I'll, we'll take another question if we have time, very brief. Um, but. I wanna say just a couple of things about that. This is so tremendous. Thank you very much for that great question. So on this issue of there's so much, the volume is so crazy, right? It loses impact each one. That's true, yet at the same time, 
there's another edge to that sword, right? Virality of stories, which is the most democratized part of the new economic and communication ecosystem, right? Virality of information is more powerful than ever. So in other words, the democratized aspect of it is also the most powerful aspect and sometimes the most injurious. So what I mean by that is that it's true there's a sea of information out there that has no impact, but when it does, when one piece gets virality from a democratic uh, platforms, it has more power, more power than what Hearst thought his, his newspaper did. His newspaper had more power maybe in New York City amongst that population. Although there were, there were diversified voices. But think about the biggest stories, the things that you can't get out of your mind today. The virality is what made that happen, right? So, it, so the democratization of the information is at the same time the biggest threat to democracy. Because the, the virality stories, the viral stories, are, tend to be the ones that degrade our discourse and degrade our ability to understand and be democratic citizens. Number two, on the other issue, um, that you brought up in, in the very beginning of your question, right? Which was about, um, lost my train of thought on that. Um, do you recall the beginning of your question? <laughs> I mean, it's the vehicle. We're talking about the vehicle. Which oh, I, I know what it was. Vehicle, yes. Yes. That was it. So here, here's the youth. It's, it's funny that I forgot it because of my favorite part, right? You said it's great to get this history because people didn't even know how to read at that time. Right? A lot of people didn't know how to read, right? And that's true. And, and with literacy came a greater power for those newspapers, right? Again, a good thing and a bad thing in some ways, right? Made more people susceptible, but also empowered more people. What I would say to you is that today, the concept, the, the, the implications have changed a little bit, and the details have obviously changed, but the concept is the same. What I'm saying is we don't know how to read. Yeah, we haven't learned how to yeah. read. We need to learn how to read for 2023 and beyond. Learning how to read means something a little different than what learning how to read did back then. I want to learn how to read with you in the next session, next Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.